the only D I ever got was in high school chemistry. And the only class that I didn't do well in in high school was biology. And I really don't like science. It's really hard. And so I'm probably not going to get a good grade in this class. Those are the whispered confessions that people feel compelled to tell me when they find out that I teach and do science. Um, their relief at making these admissions is palpable. And I think it reveals the very complicated relationship that we often have with science. On the one hand, it awes and amazes us. And on the other hand, it's a little bit scary sometimes. And it seems really hard. And like only some people can do it. But I'm hoping that I can convince you otherwise. So I'm thinking that most of us wake up each morning and we start off by thinking we'd like to make the world a little bit of a better place today, but it's really hard. We have jobs to go to, kids that need to be ferried around, pets to feed, homes to take care of, and you just think to yourself, where am I gonna squeeze in a little time to like save the world today, <laughs> all right? Um, but I think it's actually possible to save the world right from the comfort of your own couch or my personal favorite from my desk at work when my boss is not looking. You might be able to save the world a little bit out in the backyard with your kids or grandkids while you're out on the boat on the lagoon or the ocean or even while you're just walking down an urban street. I'm gonna start by defining citizen science before I really get into what citizen science looks like. Citizen science is sometimes known as community science. The word citizen is a little bit loaded these days. Um, but citizen science is the voluntary participation of the public in the monitoring, observation, collecting, or analysis of data in real research projects for real scientists happening all over the world. And today, more and more of those projects are actually involving the public in the design of the experimentation and also the dissemination of findings, which allows people to really get involved and help solve problems that are specific to them and that matter to them, either in their local community or in the global community. And a lot of times, you're doing both at the same time. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history. I think from what I could figure out that one of the oldest citizen science projects was back in the late 1800s. There was this guy, Wells Cook, and he organized a government program to monitor bird migration in North America, and it was designed to actually incorporate private citizens' work. And today, the data cards that were written with like fountain pens are being scanned and included in a public database. And then around the 1900s, the Audubon Society started doing bird counts. They created these circles all around the country where there was a lead scientist and then they had a flock of citizens. <laughs> I did it. Um, that would help them with those counts. And today, those projects are still going. They include the annual Christmas bird count, the annual uh, or the great backyard bird count, and often uh, also eBird now. So there's a lot of those bird count studies still going on connected to the Audubon Society. And in 1999, the internet was just revving up for those of us that remember. And SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I should make a joke about Earth, fill it in. They had to go somewhere else to look for it. Okay. Um, so they got lots of people, millions of users, to permit their computers that were connected to the internet to be used to search um, for signals of intelligent life in space. So essentially, they took all these computers and created a giant supercomputer on the cheap. Um, and that project is still going, and you can still participate in SETI's work by getting online and going to SETI.com if you're hoping to see ET. But there's actually citizen science projects out there for everyone. So today, I'm going to serve as your personal salesperson to citizen science. And I'm going to introduce you to my favorite projects, keeping in mind that I'm a biologist, and so everything I do connects to biology. But it turns out there's these other disciplines. I hear there's something called physics, astronomy, chemistry. Um, and there are projects for all of those as well. So, work with me. What are we looking at? Shout it out. 
somebody knows. Yes, which is known as the powerhouse of the cell, the only thing anyone remembers from high school biology. The irony of that is we actually don't know very much about mitochondria. But scientists in the UK are trying to get a better understanding of mitochondria. So they have taken terabytes of images using electron microscopy, and they need you to sit at your desk, possibly while you're at work, taking a little mental break, and they need you to help identify those mitochondria, because it turns out that artificial intelligence can't discern between the membranes of a mitochondria and the membranes of all of the other membrane-bound organelles. For once, we are smarter. This is exciting. <laughs> With your help, it speeds up the whole process. They can go through these terabytes of data much faster, and we might be able to better understand how mitochondria function. And if you think this isn't important, I'd like to point out that if your mitochondria aren't working optimally, you are aging. Just putting it out there. It's a little important. OK. Um, if, on the other hand, you're like, I don't want to be inside, or only when it's raining. If it's a nice day, I want to go outside. You might be interested in the Audubon program's Florida Eagle Watch. This program needs people to go outside a couple times a month during the nesting season and monitor eagle nests. They're looking for locations, activity, possible disturbances. It's a little bit important. It's our national symbol of freedom. We'd like them to be successful. We had a little run in a few years back where we weren't so good with the eagle thing. So we're doing a little better now. We've got 1,500 pairs of nesting eagles in Florida, but only about 600 of those nests are being monitored at this time. Now, some of you might like frogs, and others of you just thinking about them or picturing them jumping at your face and you want to leave the room right now. This project is for both of you, because this project is through the University of Florida, and they're interested in the impact of management of Cuban tree frogs on native tree frogs. By management, we mean killing. Euthanizing humanely. It turns out Cuban tree frogs, as adorable as they might be, they are also not just a nuisance for people, they're really bad for Florida wildlife. They literally eat our native tree frogs. And our native tree frogs, the barking, the squirrel, the pine barrens, they're like little Kelly green boxes. I'm not a big frog, but these guys are cute. I'm just like, you gotta see one before you think you don't like frogs. But if you're not into eagles or frogs, maybe you're into horseshoe crabs. And by into horseshoe crabs, I mean spiders, because that's actually what they are. Uh, they just happen to live in the ocean and along the beach, which apparently makes them cuter. Um, but these guys are really important. They lay lots of eggs. It's critical food for shorebirds. And it turns out the FDA requires that any injectable, any injectable at all, including vaccines, have to be tested using horseshoe crab blood. Horseshoe crab blood is super cool. It clots up with in the presence of bacteria. So it's how we test for the sterility of vaccines and other injectables. Florida Fish and Wildlife is responsible for managing this really important, although tiny, fishery. But they're so under-resourced that they need citizen scientists to monitor a section of beach and count horseshoe crabs. And some people even get selected to be a tagger. So you get to tag horseshoe crabs and then go look for them again. 9% reciting rate. It's a lot of looking with not a lot of return. But it does help them understand what the size of that population is and to make management and policy decisions about it. OK. Maybe you want to visit places in the world you've never been before. So you can drop in on video feeds of the plains of Kenya, the mountains of Croatia, the Thames River, which still has living things in it. And if you've been there, you know where the shock in my voice is coming from. Um, otters, there's otters. So you can literally watch these videos, and they just want you to click what you see. Like, do I see an elephant? Click, I see three. This helps scientists better understand, these ones in particular from, from Kenya, they're examining the impact of wildlife corridors, which is also important in Florida, where we are also working on developing wildlife corridors for the Florida panther. So when we learn something in one place, scientists can transfer it someplace else. Maybe you want to visit places in the world that you have a connection to. I like to visit the Cerrado, which is in Brazil, because my husband is from Brazil. And this is my little way of trying to imagine what it might have been like to grow up where jaguars and ocelots roam. He didn't see them. 
He apparently lived in like a city, but you know, I like to imagine. So I spy on ocelots and jaguars. And this work is really important too, because it turns out the Cerrado is one of the, it is the most biodiverse savanna in the world, more than Africa. It occupies 21% of the landmass of Brazil, second only to the Amazon, and it has 34 endemic species. That means they live nowhere else on Earth except there, and 14 of them are mammals. But right now, They've got cattle ranching, they've got the paper industry, and now coffee plantations are moving in. So some Brazilian organizations are trying to create new parks and reserves in this really special place, but they need to know whether or not those parks and reserves are working to conserve biodiversity. So you watching and clicking on what you're seeing is helping them to better understand if they've located those parks in the right place. But maybe you're like, all this conservation science is not my thing. That's okay. How about you find a cure or a treatment for a disease, like Alzheimer's? It's a big one. We don't have any cures or treatments yet. But researchers at Cornell are working on it using a mouse model. And what they learned was that there's a link between stalls in the brain and Alzheimer's disease. A stall is when blood doesn't flow properly through a capillary. It looks like this. Let's see if I can get this to work. Watch in that red oval, and you should see white start to flow through, and then it breaks into little black uh, lines through it. That's where the blood is not flowing properly. That's a stall. And that mouse brain would be a great model to use, but there's thousands of these movies and thousands of mice that don't all have the stalls. So what they did was they gamified it. So you actually play this as a game and you earn a score every time you're right. They mix in videos that have already been reviewed with videos that have never been seen before to assess your accuracy. And don't worry, Lots of people are seeing the same video, so if you make a mistake, crowdsourcing will catch it. You can also pool your score as a team. So if you want to, say, get kids in one class competing against another, or like the marketing department against the accounting department, it could kind of be a fun way to help out a really important research project that could change the world for people suffering from Alzheimer's. But maybe I still haven't convinced you. We live in Vero. We're on the beach. I'm guessing a lot of you like to walk on the beach at sunset with someone you like to spend time with. Just drop a little app called Marine Debris Tracker on your phone. And as you walk along the beach, if you see any pollution, plastic bottles, cigarette butts, pieces of metal, pieces of cloth, fishing line, you just log it right in on the app. It's super easy. If you see something really exciting, you can take a picture and upload it. And all of that data is available to scientists all over the world and to you. So you can see what that data looks like. And I grabbed that map photo just on Wednesday, and what you should take note of is that there has been no data collected from Vero to Melbourne. So as of right now, scientists have no idea how pollution is flowing in this area, where it's coming from, where it's going, or any way to make decisions about what to do about it. Now, when I was growing up, my parents essentially kicked me out the back door right after breakfast and told me not to come back until lunch. I wandered miles, forests, fields, streams, backyards. That was when trespassing wasn't like a big deal. Um, and to be fair, my parents were kind of quasi-hippies who actually believed that marigolds and a battery-operated radio would save our garden from deer and tomato hornworms. So I, I live differently. I'm just, you know, I acknowledge. Um, but all of that wandering led to a lot of wondering. And for me, Wondering is all about curiosity and exploration, and I haven't stopped being curious, and I haven't stopped exploring, and I want kids today to be that way, and I would like you to be that way, and I think iNaturalist is the single best way you can contribute to citizen science while tapping into your curiosity and your exploration. So iNaturalist is an app that you put on your phone, and it lets you just collect images of everything you see anywhere you go, and scientists can cull that data for projects. So to date, we have about 2 million registered users, over 28 million observations of 239,000 different species through citizen scientists all over the world. And locally, we have the Environmental Learning Center, we have Harbor Branch, we have the Smithsonian, we have McKee, just to name a few that are using iNaturalist and need your help collecting data. When you just go for a walk outside, so, oh, there's a bug. Turns out that bug is a jewel weevil. It's invasive. We need to know it's here so we can treat it 
before it gets to our crops, right? We live in an agricultural area. We need a first alert system, and iNaturalist can act in that way. That's just one example of the things that can be done from iNat. So before I finish, because obviously I've just scratched the surface here of citizen science, and there are so many other projects out there. You can listen to bat vocalizations, you can search for new planets and galaxies, you can even review drone footage to find safe routes for aid workers after a hurricane. There is something out there for everyone. So check out Zooniverse, Instant Wild, citizenscience.gov, just Google it, scistarter.com. All of those can hook you up with exciting citizen science science projects. But I'd like you to just do one thing for me right now. In your mind, I want you to create an image of a scientist, a scientist whose work has changed the world for good. Just picture it. Some of you might have Einstein, relativity. Some of you might have Newton and the apple. Maybe you have some other things. But I have a picture in my mind, and it's abundantly clear to me. That picture looks exactly like you. You're the next round of scientists. So go contribute to science, be a scientist, do real and meaningful scientific research through citizen science. Thank you so much.